guys, and I'm joined here today by my colleague Gianfranco Cecconi on behalf of the Support Center for Data Sharing. Support Center for Data Sharing is an EU initiative that aims to raise awareness among businesses, public bodies, academia and citizens about both the possibilities, the challenges and the benefits of data sharing. Data, with data sharing, we refer to transactions in which data held by public or private sector, uh, by the public or private sector, are made available to other organizations to use and reuse. Uh, and to raise awareness around this topic, we showcase not only data sharing practices, but we also research EU legal frameworks and provide legal and technical support to organizations who wish to share data. And we also aim to learn from stakeholders why they share data, what inspired them and how they did it. And therefore, today we will interview Ryan King, the CEO of FOAM, to discuss how location data can be shared in a secure and transparent environment. Uh, FOAM is a US-based company that provides the tools to enable decentralized location services and a crowdsourced map. And before we get into more detailed questions, Ryan, would you like to introduce yourself uh, and the company? Uh, hi, very happy to be here. My name is Ryan. Uh, as said, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Foam Space Corp. Uh, we're behind a protocol called Foam, which works on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, we're based in the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and we're excited to hear to speak about how we're working on new location services and what kind of data sharing we imagine that entails. Nice. Thank you for that. Um, can you tell us what inspired Foam? How did this came to be? Um, sure. So myself and my two co-founders all have a background in architecture, actually, to some extent. Uh, my CTO, uh, Christopher, worked on like the Apple campus with Foster and Partners in uh, London. Um, my other co-founder worked as an architect on things like Audi, and I was kind of studying at Columbia more on the theoretical side. And so when we saw um, just the developments happening with blockchain technology and decentralization, we just kind of got excited uh, from kind of an urban background of how this technology may impact the physical world or how the software may impact, you know, the built environment. And so we started kind of thinking about uh, blockchain technology from a very early uh, stage in 2015 of how, you know, it may impact the city. Um, and so we started thinking about things like a spatial index. Um, one of the benefits of blockchain is interoperability. So all data can kind of uh, be on the same playing field. And so we very early on started envisioning kind of the cross between a Google Maps and a Bloomberg terminal. If everything is kind of becoming financialized and you can have everything be interoperable, then can we kind of look at the city in a new way? And that's where we started thinking about decentralization and kind of spatial thinking uh, back in the day. It's, it's quite interesting to see the roots into the physical environment because for the ones of us who are more courageous and try to learn about blockchain, it still remains something very abstract, right? Something very digital, ephemeral in a way. But And, and perhaps it, you owe that very original idea exactly thanks to that experience that you have a very tangible physical world problem, isn't it? And and um, the, for the ones watching this, I mean, we, we had the idea from, uh, of interviewing you from uh, a, a, an intervention you've done during and release a conference organized by the commission where you presented also the phone solution. And, and, and I actually had to take, to take some time to think about it. How is this working? I could not get it. So can you, can you actually tell us what are location services in general and why we need the blockchain for those? That is exactly the same question I put to you then. I believe. <laughs> um, yeah, so location services kind of fall in what is called a PNT. Uh, so this is like positioning, navigation and timing. Uh, and for the most part, these services are kind of covered uh, for uh, through GPS, the global uh, positioning system, uh, which is this constellation of satellites. Um, there are now other systems, so Galileo and uh, EU, as well as uh, different Russian and Chinese. So they all generally cover that service of positioning, navigation, and timing. Um, and this has kind of been an extremely uh, high innovation unlock. So through kind of this uh, technology being available to civilian and commercial use, we've seen innovation happening in everything from kind of shipping lanes to calling an Uber to pick you up. Um, so our reliance on these systems is continuing to grow, um, but their ability to kind of transform and upgrade is um, a bit more marginal. And so in recent years, we've seen a lot of uh, concerns around things like spoof uh, spoofing or jamming or disruptions to GPS services. Um, and it's kind of come to a point where the United States government has said this is 
you know, an issue that we actually need to look into alternatives or backups. Um, and so the Department of Transportation in the US recently had kind of a call for companies to present backups and alternatives. And interestingly enough, the conclusion was not one company could uh, offer a full backup to all the positioning, navigation, and timing services of these satellite systems. And so the what we will have in the future is more of an ecosystem of PNT solutions uh, that will uh, provide different services for different use cases. And in the phone case, what we're looking to provide to the market is uh, essentially cryptographic attestations about your location uh, and using kind of a terrestrial based location system that is uh, more on the spectrum of open source and more on the spectrum of low cost compared to proprietary or very expensive uh, radios as we're using um, a low power radio called LoRa and kind of cutting edge components in software defined radios and FPGA chips. Um, and so we're looking to establish a terrestrial based location system where that service will be local to where that service is needed and can grow uh, or grow kind of asynchronously in different locations at different times. And something that trying to interpret what you're saying with my, let's say, non-expert head in, in the conversation. Um, you, you made the point of uh, the networks, the GPS networks, for example, being potentially subject to disruption, but it's not just that, right? Even if you wanted to start a new one, even if a private organization wanted to start a traditional location network, the investment for that, I guess, would be enormous, right? Co sa sending satellite in space, apart from space being crowded already as it is, is expensive. Uh, worldwide coverage is massively expensive. And then you have the point of trustworthiness. I may trust Galileo, I may not trust uh, I don't know, the American system, I may trust the Chinese one. And uh, you know, I, from what I understand of your solution, I hope you're going to explain it to, it, to us now, is there's also an extra element in a way. It's not just complementing those networks, but also creating a, a, an element of trust where you can't really cheat about where you are, right? Yeah, so that's kind of the intention. So we call it proof of location. Um, and so the intention of the service is not to compete with GPS on like navigation, but to offer a service where people can kind of check in in a way that can't be cheated and kind of create like a receipt book, like a checkbook of all the places you have been as a user and then in a way that can be privacy preserving um, and that's where we'll get into data sharing of why would you kind of want these fraud proof uh, certificates about your location is because it can unlock a lot of different value in businesses or use cases so um, with gps or other satellite systems uh, they currently work uh, mostly one way uh, at least on the civilian band so um, the satellites themselves don't know where the users are uh, the users just rely on the satellites to find out where they are. And so it's kind of trivial to then lie about your location and pass it on to somebody else. Uh, the application you submit it to doesn't, they can't ask the satellites like, hey, is this <laughs> correct? Um, and so we see a lot of cheating and spoofing um, on the trivial side, whether that's from Uber or Amazon delivery drivers to Pokemon Go players to kind of then more nefarious uh, use cases. And so we're trying to build a service that uh, c people can kind of build, generate these receipts, we call them presence claims, and then use them in all different use cases of how they want to share that location uh, data. But the idea is they could only obtain it uh, by being in this area of coverage. Um, and then I'll go into it, but the idea is that the, where this service is then needed um, through different incentive mechanisms, people can be incentivized to build out the network so it's not just one company waiting for a client like with a port. Uh, we have some PNT companies that will like install radios at a port, but that network is only going to be at that port until a client hires them to put it somewhere else. So um, when it comes to an open network, we want anyone to then be able to add uh, coverage in a low cost manner relative to launching a satellite. And that was, in fact, my, my next question. So foam is not another set of devices somewhere, antennas, or beacons uh, or satellites. Uh, in a way, FOM, but I, I would like you to explain that to, to our audience, is more like a, a way of working together in a way. You, 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 the, very, the very first thing you said, I believe, is, is that you created a FOM protocol. Uh, can, you, can you tell us what, uh, what exactly is this FOM protocol? Um, sure, so the protocol is uh, essentially the rules of the system of how you can participate and how you can be a service provider uh, and then how you can be a consumer. So on the service provider side, um, it's kind of the supply side of the market. 
So that means we need people to actually install these radios um, and set up coverage. Um, so similar to GPS or other satellite systems, you need at least four radio beacons um, to establish the service. And that's for X, Y, Z, and a fourth for checking time to be able to do things like time difference of arrival to do localization. Um, so we have our first test network in the Brooklyn Navy Yard where there are four different radios on four different rooftops. Uh, we call our radios in the foam protocol a zone anchor. And so then at least four of these anchors can create a zone of coverage. Uh, and the idea is that uh, to participate, you will need to kind of use foam tokens, which have a monetary value. Uh, it's kind of thought of like a taxi medallion, like a right to participate. And so these radio operators will kind of lock up these tokens into a service level agreement, uh, essentially promising uptime and promising to kind of follow the rules of the protocol correctly. And so the rules of the protocol may say, you know, you have to stay in sync uh, time-wise to this uh, degree. Uh, you must post uh, updates to the blockchain every, you know, 10th uh, hour or something to that effect. And then if a user interacts with you, you must produce a certificate for them and issue it for them. Um, and so the protocol itself can kind of then check, are these radios operating correctly? Are they operating honestly? Uh, are they cheating? Are they offline? And if so, the protocol can enforce like kind of the rules. And so the idea is that nobody needs to trust each other, but the system itself uh, can be trusted because the incentives will be aligned for people to participate. And so in these very early stages, it is kind of uh, collaborative in that uh, people will be building early networks and reporting their results and kind of uh, walking around with sensors, testing the network uh, before it's a kind of a commercial system. So there's a, a community building element as well. Well, to describe this, uh, really what made it um, trigger for me because the, so for the ones uh, who will watch this video who know a little about blockchain, they may know the concept of proof of work. So in a way the nodes, the ones that coin new Bitcoin, for example, or Ethereum, uh, they do work to get to that point. In a, in a way, and um, correct me if my analogy does not work, that kind of commitment to be uptime for a certain amount of time, to be on, to be uh, to have the clock synchronized, and to be in the actual position they claim to be, uh, a bit of the equivalent of this kind of proof of work. What, what gives them the right to be part of the of the network? Uh, yeah, uh, so you can just call it then proof of location. <laughs> and so kind of like these radios are like mining triangulations in a way. So every time they can like post uh, to the database, in this case, which is the blockchain, like a hash pointing to that they successfully did another round of kind of maintaining quorum on time and space in this zone, they could be rewarded in tokens. So that's about aligning incentives to keep everything. You know, the tokens are similar to, uh, let's say, blockchain-based currency that we know of. So for example, if I, as a private individual, I wanted to install um, an anchor at my house, mm. uh, what should I do? Um, <laughs> yeah, so either uh, you'll be joining like an existing zone of, that, of a network that already exists, uh, or you'll be establishing your own. If you're establishing your own from scratch, uh, you'll need at least four. Um, and then there'll be kind of a user experience process uh, where you can kind of uh, attest where your location is uh, to establish the zone and kind of stake your tokens. And then there's a lot of kind of game theory, interesting components of if you are a zone all by itself, do you start earning rewards right away because nobody knows if you're really there or not? And so there's a we've explored in our blog post different mechanisms of how you can kind of verify that. So maybe there's an actor in the system called a mobile verifier who actually moves around and goes to new zones. And until you've like attracted this user to like check in with you, then you don't earn rewards yet. Maybe your rewards stay locked. And so there's a lot of different. Uh, game situations like that, like how do you trust a new zone that's all by itself, or how can you start a trusted zone and then have zones grow out from it. And so that'll be really exciting as we're now ready to have people build these test zones of how we can stress test it and do all these kind of game theory tests of how people would be potentially cheating it. But the goal ultimately is that it's fault tolerant and not able to be spoofed. Uh, but we'll have a more real world testing to get there. That's so cool.
Yeah. But uh, let, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, so I, I like the point you made about I may have my own. I may start my own network, and and the qu natural question that comes from that is so. Um, oh, we lost him. I'm here. Oh, sorry. Uh, so where where's the money for you? So what's the business model for Foam? Uh, how does it work for you? Um, so ultimately, we want to be a network participant ourselves. Um, uh, so that may mean initially like selling hardware to the people who want to get started uh, as we've kind of designed the architecture. Um, but long term, uh, as we believe in this network, we want to be a leading network participant. So that means our company itself may be uh, working with real estate companies to get access to locations or kind of working with enterprises who want to need this service to kind of show how to make money off this kind of protocol uh, and show how you can build a business around it. And then basic things like the front end and how you're going to manage uh, the interface of these and the cost of that uh, and API, et cetera. So there may be like paid versions of how to manage your dashboard. And then additionally, there is this foam token, uh, which is meant to be not a uh, currency per se, but it's essentially a uh, governance token. It's like your right to the protocol. So it's as if you were able to like uh, purchase a percent of HTTP protocol uh, in the early days of the internet, uh, which is now used everywhere. Uh, and I, and also hidden to the mainstream users. You don't really need to know how it works uh, to utilize it. And so the idea is that um, all the people who are putting in this early work to build out these networks and are earning foam tokens also have a stake in the protocol. So they have a, a right to maybe make governance decisions. Um, and that's kind of a new model of like decentralized decision making that we're seeing a lot of projects uh, explore. And so the idea is that um, we will have a stake in that protocol as uh, the creators of it, but so will the all the participants. And so the idea is that um, as the initiators of this network, hopefully we can then focus on use cases after and our business model will be around, you know, using the network versus uh, bootstrapping it. Okay, well, so that's cool. So let me try to summarize this and then hand over to, 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 to Ray, just to, to try to make a three minute summary of everything we said. So as an alternative and a complement of traditional location networks based on most cases, ex-military infrastructure, say satellites uh, and um, and large scale industrial expensive to run uh, systems. Today we have the technology that enables a network of peers to create location services that serves themselves in a way by running, uh, as you say, anchors uh, that um, in a network together and with a system of incentives uh, based on the blockchain can in a way sustain itself um, and on your side as the creator of the protocol can also give you the opportunity to maintain your own business by providing perhaps value-added services um, or uh, as a system integrator and uh, consulting perhaps to the company that want to invest the most into this. Plus, on the side, of course, the more sophisticated element of this uh, governance token and participating into the protocol. It, it's such a diverse, uh, say, model from the ones perhaps most of the people reading our website are used to, that I thought it was useful perhaps to go back to it. And I hope <laughs> I was uh, um, pre <laughs> precise enough in, in making the summary. Um, Ray, what do you think? Yeah, I think. To me, this is still a quite abstract uh, concept. Uh, so to maybe to make it a bit more tangible, um, could you highlight a, a, a specific use case um, and, and and tell us how I, as a user, would make use of your your tools? Um, sure. So maybe the easiest off the top of my mind is this proof of location. Clearly, is kind of um, a market need, and that you see it kind of trying to be addressed in some ways. So. Now, when Amazon will deliver a package, they take a photo of where the package, uh, where they drop the package. So that's like a, works as a proof of delivery. Um, but for example, I got a package. It said it was delivered. I can't find the package. I look at the proof of delivery, and it's a photo of someone's house that's not mine. So I'm like, OK, <laughs> it was delivered. And there's a photo of where it was delivered, but I have no idea where that house is. Um, so you can imagine in a system where um, so foam is like a primitive, so it's just a new way to have a location piece of information. 
uh, applications can then design around that. So you could imagine a delivery application uh, that kind of locks the payment to the delivery driver in a smart contract or some escrow. And when they kind of submit this proof of that they're at the location where the delivery should be, um, and they can't cheat that, uh, the payment maybe gets unlocked. And you, as the user, uh, get not only get an email that your um, package was delivered, but you can actually go and look at this database uh, and actually see cryptographically that you know somebody had checked in your house and your package was there. Um, mm -hmm. so it can give efficiency to use the user, uh, having peace of mind knowing where your items are. But then, from a logistics point of view, kind of uh, an Amazon can actually have a stronger capability to believe in where their workforce is. Um, and we have Amazon drivers like hiding their phones in trees near the warehouse to pretend they're closer to actually get get the assignment uh, to get the job. So there's just like a lot of like areas where there's um, room for adding robust location proofs. And mm -hmm. so that could be then plugged into any use case where location is used. Uh, mm -hmm and kind of be used as a trigger to unlock something, whether that's like a Pokemon in the game, like, hey, anyone who came to Times Square gets this rare game item, or it could be something in retail, like for a Nike shop or loyalty points, um, or in like a supply chain, even just like seeing how many people are in a port if everyone had to check in through that system mm -hmm. to know if it's congested or not. Um, so that's kind of where we see like proof of location, uh, being able to unlock mm -hmm. a lot of value. And then on like the less abstract side, it's kind of like a DIY project and like people are gonna be installing radios on roofs and like doing kind of experiments and walking around with antennas to kind of test the system in this stage. And those people mm -hmm. will be like incentivized uh, by mm -hmm. gaining ownership in the phone network. Um, so yeah. before there are these use cases, we first need to test it like in the mountains and in a high density area and a field and so these first uh, zones will just kind of be existing for advancing the project, uh, yeah. not really a specific use case. Yeah, yeah, because I can imagine that it works uh, really well if a lot of people are uh, contributing to it. So you need like multiple actors to make the system work. Um, how do you ensure that? Because if people are not participating, then you can't trust the location services, right? Um, yeah, well, I can't say I can guarantee it, but at least in the blockchain space, uh, incentive models are really what is driving things. So uh, that's where people basically will go on roofs or do this hard work if they're earning like uh, tokens and they're actually like feeling like they're earning a stake in the project um, mm -hmm. and then have a voice. Um, and so community building will be really important for how we kind of roll this out, but also attracting the right kind of people who will be dedicated and kind of be motivated by feeling ownership in the project. And so mm -hmm. for our next phase, if we want to have like five different zones in different locations, that'll also be a lot easier to point to different potential users and say, well, you know, this network exists in this early stages. If you, if we set one up in Texas and then we talk to a drone company in Texas, we could say you could already try it now. And then if it's a service that's valuable to them, like there are mechanisms in place to incentivize where the network can grow. But it's definitely a kind of uh, slow process and that we've been developing this for a few years and they'll be testing mm -hmm. for uh, some time before it's kind of a commercial service. Mm -hmm. And where would you see the, the biggest challenges there? Um, definitely on designing the program so that people mm -hmm. stay motivated and don't potentially get burnt out. And I think uh, practically right now, one of the largest challenges will actually be on the supply chain side. Um, Mm -hmm. Being able to obtain all the components needed in a timely manner that kind of matches these kind of initiatives um, seems like that problem is only going to be growing. There is competition from more traditional players. For example, Apple announcing AirTag a few days ago. Potentially every iPhone becomes an anchor in their own location network. Is that a risk to you in a way? Um, not at all, because Apple is like, extremely uh, all about a closed network. So while they uh, the AirTag system does a great job to keep your location data private. Um, it's unclear how you can get any of that information outside of the Find My iPhone network. Um, how could you put that data onto a blockchain? Uh, how can you sign a message cryptographically from your iCloud account? I think it's kind of a closed system. So it's, and it's very much about finding something that's lost versus proving where you were at a certain point in the past. Um, it's extremely interesting and exciting that there's this like 
kind of network that's just appearing overnight <laughs> through this um, find like using iPhones as relayers. Um, it just kind of with us, we want that you have full control of your location data uh, and can share it how you want, and uh, ideally in this privacy-preserving manner, but also through these blockchain systems. And so I don't see it as competition or even overlapping enough uh, because it's kind of a closed system. Yeah, and besides your protocol, uh, that's actually a good question. Is, is your protocol open? Uh, is it implemented in, in, in open source software? Perhaps there is a reference implementation. How easy it is for, say, um, a third party or the crowd to, to help you developing the protocol of writing uh, the software? Um, well, it's not uh, open right now. Our intention is that we're an open source project um, and we're also working with kind of open source components. So we, I mentioned we build on an FPGA. Uh, right now we're using one called an ICE40 that actually has like a reverse engineered tool chain. So it's like completely open source um, as well as uh, the other aspects we're using in the hardware. Um, and we use a language called Clash, uh, which is a functional programming language which compiles uh, to Verilog for FPGAs. And so we've contributed their open source uh, and we've contributed in the past to maintaining multiple open source Ethereum and blockchain libraries. So that's definitely um, part of the ethos. Um, there may be some creative ways that that goes about where the code is available, but there's like a non-commercial, non-compete time period. Um, but definitely the long-term goals is that this is uh, on the open source side of the spectrum. Um, and so that uh, ideally, if the service is, you know, taking off that anyone could assemble their own as a DIY or someone could make it their own business out of selling phone compatible devices. And then uh, we're working with the LoRa radio and the software defined radio stack right now uh, that people can build these own anchors. But uh, as a software, we could also potentially exist on other radio networks. And we've uh, did a pilot with Verizon last fall uh, exploring 5G. Um, and so you can kind of move the phone software to other radio networks as well and so could even be integrated into a satellite so uh, we're focused on the blockchain side the fault tolerance side and then how your location proof can be used or stored that's very cool cool what do you see going forward so like five years from now where are you with phone um five years from now let's oh, maybe it's short you can you can also do 10 10 years from now 10 years okay uh yeah. Yeah. In 10 years, uh, phone space uh, will have kind of proven its way in the market of showing why secure location proofs can actually unlock an enormous amount of value and use cases. Um, and that will be kind of a decentralized network that's actually governed not just by one corporation, but have a number of stakeholders and participants. And I imagine by then the protocol will kind of fractal, fracture beyond just our initial community uh, low power radios and kind of be a standard, hopefully, that can persist through multiple networks. Um, and OM is not meant to necessarily be competitive, but kind of uh, be absorbed by anyone that could add this like level of security into their systems. Um, and that's only the beginning for us. It's taking a lot of time to work on <laughs> hardware and radios. Uh, but we imagine uh, there's a lot of opportunity in kind of spatial data and the uh, blockchain and how to visualize that or monetize that and build interoperable systems. So um, we would be interested in blockchainifying not only the signals coming off the roof of a building, but maybe the rest of the building as well and exploring shared ownership and new ways to govern physical space beyond just um, location tracking. So hopefully by then phone expands uh, into other kind of domains of the real world as well. Nice. Nice. Do you have any competition in that field right now, by the way? Um, so there's uh, companies working on like terrestrial location services, um, mm -hmm. but as like traditional companies, uh, at least as I understand it now, they install them mm -hmm. where they have a client. Um, mm -hmm. And then there are, uh, there is another like locate, uh, not location, but the IoT based blockchain project. Um, that incentivizes people to install these radios as well, but it's not for a location service. It's just for like um, IoT backhaul. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, they have shown uh, extreme success in getting like thirty thousand radios built and like people putting them on their roofs uh, to earn tokens. So it really kind of shows 
uh, that this new model has really come uh, and there's we can now explore it of how can you mm -hmm. build a global community and get people actually working for the protocol mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. be incentivized to do so. Um, so we've seen that in a project called Helium that uses low power radios. Um, and so that shows how this kind of model can work. And so we're specifically trying to bring a new location service to market. Um, and so those incentives uh, potentially can bring a new way of people to come together, uh, build communities, but also be stakeholders in a project in a way that wasn't able to be done before. Nice. John Franco, is there anything you want to add? Well, if, before you leave, if you can, I have a stupid question, perhaps. Do you actually have an anchor there with you that you can show to the camera? <laughs> um, yeah, actually, I did. Oh, nice. wow. uh, so that's what we have on the roofs. Um, and this is kind of a hybrid between off the shelf and with custom components. So we're currently working on the next version that will be like manufactured as like one board. Um, yeah. So probably much, much more than that. You want to need to worry about the space it takes to, to install it somewhere. Like you, you, you screw it in the wall and you, and you forget about it probably. Yeah, so that, that, that'll be what will be like manufactured um, and given out. But because the technology actually works now, uh, we'll be making an open call to kind of try and build at least like five zones with this current hardware. Uh, that might be a little bit headache inducing if a wire comes unplugged or it shakes and something uh, gets rattled, but the early adopters will be rewarded for the headaches. <laughs> nice. uh, I'm very grateful. Thanks, Ryan, for being with us. Yeah, thank you. So Is much there anything you want to add that we haven't touched upon? from your site? Um, well, if you're interested to learn more about Foam, uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Foam Space or visit our website at foam.space, the word. Um, and we're definitely looking to interested to connect with anyone who would be interested in learning more about these networks, but especially running them in these early stages. So please get in touch.